1. Determination A notable physician from the state of Chu named Bach Kong Thung devoted his days to thoughts of assassinating Tu Tai and defeating the state of Zheng. One morning he stood so still and lost in thought that the horsewhip he held reversed its grip, stabbing him in the chin and causing blood to flow to the ground unnoticed by Thang. Hearing of this, someone from Zheng remarked, if one can forget the blood flowing from their own body, what else could possibly distract them? This illustrates that a person with a highly focused will can encounter obstacles, whether it's stumbling upon a tree, colliding with a rock, or falling into a pit, and remain utterly unaware. Commentary This story also carries a philosophical essence, as it speaks to the idea of almost absolute determination. Nothing in the human world is absolute. Zheng killed Thang's father, and Tu Tai of Chu was Thang's uncle who went to save Zheng. Thus, Thang harbored a grudge against Tu Tai. Indeed, before this, Tu Tai had once assisted Thang. Setting aside all historical context, this is a reflection on the meaning of determination. Thang's determination was so intense that he was oblivious to a sharp object piercing his skin and drawing blood. A similar instance occurred in Vietnam when the Mongolians were invading. At that time, Pham Ngu Lao was merely a commoner with a burning desire to save his country. He was weaving a basket in the middle of the road when the carriage of General Tron Hung Dao passed by. Despite the soldiers' warnings, Pham Ngu Lao remained undisturbed even when a soldier's spear pierced his thigh causing blood to spill. He did not notice. Pham Ngu Lao's case is even more extraordinary than Bak Kong Thang's. According to the ancients, Pham Ngu Lao deserved to be sainted. Expanding further, Thang's motivation stemmed from personal vengeance, albeit misdirected. Zheng killed Thang's father, which was a consequence of Qian's treachery in attempting to sell his country to the state of Tan. And yet, Tu Tai's act of saving Zheng, a gesture of goodwill, led Thang to seek revenge. Meanwhile, Pham Ngu Lao was driven by a resolve to save his nation. 2. What is more shameful? In the state of Qi, there was a poor man who often begged in the marketplace within the city. Everyone grew tired of him because he would beg repeatedly. Now, no one wished to give him anything. This destitute individual sought work at the Tian family's home, performing menial tasks for their horse groomer to earn his keep. Someone said to the impoverished man, Don't you feel ashamed working for a horse groomer just to find something to eat? The man replied, The greatest shame is in begging. I have begged before without feeling shame, so why should I feel disgraced now for performing hard labor for a horse groomer to get my food? Commentary Even begging is not necessarily shameful. People beg due to circumstances, disabilities. It's a temporary solution for those unable to sustain themselves. Until the early 20th century, China still had its beggars sect. Emperor Le Than Tong of Vietnam once wrote about beggars, neither borrowing nor relying, but living off the heaven's grace, through begging. If a lazy person finds labor too demanding and prefers begging, then that person truly deserves scorn. The critique from that individual was misguided. Working for a wealthy household or for a horse groomer is still labor as long as it does not violate the law. 3. I, too, wish to drag my tail through the mud. Zhuangzi was fishing by the banks of the Bak River when the king of Chu, having heard of Zhuangzi's great wisdom, sent two high officials to invite him to assist in the governance of Chu. Zhuangzi, without turning around, still holding his fishing rod, said, I've heard that in Chu there's a sacred turtle that died 3,000 years ago. The king of Chu had its shell lacquered and placed in a shrine. Do you think that turtle preferred to die and have its body venerated, or would it rather live, dragging its tail through the mud? Both officials replied, 
It would prefer to live and drag its tail through the mud. Zhuangzi then said, I too wish to drag my tail through the mud. Commentary Zhuangzi lived a life immersed in nature and tranquility. He thrived in the latter half of the 4th century and the early 3rd century BCE, authoring the Nan Hua Jing, a philosophical work leaning towards Taoism yet acclaimed for its literary excellence. With such talent, he could have served in any government and been successful. However, he chose not to seek official position or fame, avoiding the worldly chase after status and wealth, a common pitfall among those who enter public service only to lament their fall from grace when disaster strikes. History tells us of Alexander the Great, Zhuangzi's contemporary, who, while leading his Greek army against Persia, encountered the philosopher Diogenes. Alexander, standing eastward and blocking the sunlight, asked Diogenes, What can I give you? Diogenes, with calm authority, responded, Stand out of my sunlight. Diogenes' words carry deep meaning. Firstly, by asking Alexander to move, he subtly suggested that Alexander, despite his grandeur, was merely an obstacle to the natural world. Secondly, Diogenes expressed a disdain for authority and a preference for a life of freedom, symbolized by his desire to stand in the sunlight. Both Diogenes and Zhuangzi, despite their geographical and cultural differences, are celebrated for their teachings on living a life unencumbered by societal expectations and material desires. 4. When the king wished to be a sage The king of Yan, Kauai, was deeply indulged in wine and beauty, appointing Tuchi as the prime minister. Tuchi, tall and imposing in appearance, noticed Kauai's neglect of his royal duties and harbored ambitions to usurp the throne. Forming alliances with influential courtiers like the brothers Tudai, Tule, and Lok Mao Tho, they flattered Tu Chi, calling him the virtuous one. One day, Kauai asked Tudai whether the state of Qi could become dominant with a wise leader like Mang the Constant. Dai responded that it was not possible because the king of Qi did not utilize Mang effectively. Regretting not having a wise leader like Mang, Kwai was convinced by Dai that Tu Chi was no less competent. Hearing this, Kwai granted Tu Chi extensive administrative powers. Later, Kwai inquired of Lok Mao Tho why only Nhu and Thuan were praised among ancient sages for relinquishing the throne to the virtuous instead of their own offspring. Tho explained that Nhu and Thuan's willingness to abdicate to the virtuous, unlike Vu who failed to depose the crown prince, led to Vu being considered less virtuous. Delighted, Kwai expressed his desire to abdicate in favor of Tu Chi, to which Tho agreed, likening Kauai's virtue to that of Nghu and Thuan. Kauai then convened his ministers, announcing the dethronement of Crown Prince Bin in favor of Tucci. Tucci, feigning humility to comply with ritual, accepted the throne with grand ceremony, facing south in declaration of his rule, while Kauai and his servants faced north, retiring to a secluded palace. To die, to lay, and Tho were appointed as high officials. General T.B., enraged, led a revolt against Tucci with widespread public support. After ten days of fierce fighting resulting in tens of thousands of casualties, T.B. was killed. Lok Mao Tho advised Tucci that the rebellion was spurred by Crown Prince Bin, leading to Bin's capture. Quachin Ghat helped Bin escape. Seizing the opportunity, Qi attacked Yan, claiming to quell Tu Chi's disorder, leading to the deaths of Tu Chi, his allies, and Kwai's suicide, with Qi refusing to relinquish control of Yan. Commentary The saying, enter as a servant, leave as a master, highlights the importance of self-improvement. Initially, you might learn a skill in a subservient role, but mastering it allows you to establish your own venture. 
King Kowai, tormented by his indulgences, sought to demonstrate his unique style through an extraordinarily bizarre act. Unable to assert dominance or showcase remarkable abilities, he abandoned his throne to pursue sainthood, a naive misunderstanding of saintly virtue, which requires wisdom, unlike Kawai's confusion and susceptibility to deceit by manipulators like the brothers Tudai and Tule, and the shameless Lok Mao Tho. Tu Chi, seeing Kawai's weakness, dreamt of usurpation, a common ambition, yet his lack of a peaceful reign led to inevitable retribution for him and his lineage. This forms a tragicomic chapter in history. 5. Wild Birds The book Nanhua Jing by Zhuangzi mentions wild partridges living by the marsh peck for food every ten steps. Though life is hard and barely sufficient, they never wish to be kept in cages. Living in a cage might be healthier but lacks joy. Discussion. It's not just birds. Every creature in nature prefers to roam freely in its own realm. The saying, fish in bowls and birds in cages, signifies a loss of freedom. This text reflects a philosophical perspective. Anything against nature is a form of restraint. Zhuangzi advocated that being natural is being free. 6. When love is young, even imperfect fruits seem round. Di Zixia was the beloved servant of Lord Wei. According to the laws of the state of Wei, anyone who dared to use the king's chariot without permission would have their legs cut off. One night, upon hearing that his mother had fallen seriously ill, Di Zixia hastily took the king's chariot to visit her. Lord Wei, upon learning of this, said, What a filial son! You are willing to commit a crime punishable by mutilation for your mother's sake. However, the king eventually pardoned him. One day, as the king and Di Zixia were walking in the garden, Di Zixia picked a peach, tasted it, found it delicious, and offered the remaining part to the king. The king praised him, saying, Di Zixia truly loves me. He forgets his own hunger and thinks of me first. However, after some time, the king began to grow tired of Di Zixia. It could be said that Di Zixia fell out of favor. The king remarked, He once dared to use my hunting bow without permission, and another time he offered me his leftover food. Even for these actions, he hardly deserves punishment. Commentary There's a saying in our folklore, When in love, a bitter melon split into three parts tastes sweet. When out of love, it splits into ten bitter pieces. When you adore someone, you cherish their every move. When you despise them, you disdain their entire family. Such is the way of the world. Affections and resentments cannot always remain constant. Therefore, before fully understanding someone's character, one should refrain from hastily praising or criticizing, loving or hating, to avoid regret. Maintain a calm heart for a fair judgment. Few can be like the brothers Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei. When one loves, even the worst traits seem endearing. But once the honeymoon phase is over, one starts to reassess, and the past events unroll in their mind, revealing the stark contrasts. In time, we will encounter the story of Zhang Yi and Chen Yu. This adaptation aims to capture the essence of the original narrative and its moral lessons, contextualized within a cultural framework familiar to an American audience, emphasizing the universal themes of love, judgment, and the complexity of human relationships. 7. The Story of Tricking the Monkeys In the state of Song, there was a man who was exceptionally skilled at raising macaques. He understood the psychology of the monkeys, and they, in turn, understood him. As the food supply for the troop began to dwindle, he decided to limit their food intake. He said, From now on, you'll eat three chestnuts in the morning and four in the evening, okay? 
The monkeys chattered angrily in response. Hastily, he amended, All right, all right, then you'll have four in the morning and three in the evening. This time, the monkeys were pleased. Commentary Through this story, Zhuangzi discusses how name and reality did not change, yet the monkeys' reactions of anger and joy were distinctly different. This was due to their subjective perceptions. Hence, the sage speaks of right and wrong in the pursuit of harmony, but ultimately, everything returns to the natural law. Likewise, Liezi commented, With animals, we can use our intelligence to confuse them. This principle is similar to how sages use wisdom to guide people towards understanding. The essence remains unchanged, but the outcomes can vary greatly, causing either anger or joy with different approaches. Today, this story still applies. In advertising or marketing, people rarely buy two of the same item at once, but the offer, buy one, get one free, often leads to a rush of purchases, even though it might mean paying for two items in the end. 8. The Debate Between the man with two legs and the man with one leg, Shentu Jia, who had lost a leg, and Trin Zi San, a disciple of Master Ba Han Von Han, had a disagreement. Zi San told Shentu Jia, If someone needs to go out, it should either be you or me. The next day, as they were studying together, Zi San asked, I'm about to go outside. Can you stay in? Moreover, why do you not avoid the official who is governing? Do you consider yourself his equal? Shentu Jia replied, Does Master Ba Han have an official among his disciples? You might think your position is high, as Trin's prime minister, but I've heard a mirror shines brightest when it's dust-free, and living with the virtuous keeps one from error. Right now, what you should seek is learning morality from our master, yet your words seem quite mistaken. Zisan retorted, You've ended up in this state, referring to having one leg, and yet you dare to compete with the virtuous Nhu. Have you reflected on your own virtues to see if they're enough to admonish me? Shentu Jia responded, Many people disguise their faults, thinking themselves undeserving of punishment like losing a leg. Few are those who do not hide their faults and would rather lose a leg. Only the truly moral can realize this naturally. Walking into a rain of arrows unscathed is a matter of fate. Those with two legs mocking those without, such people are everywhere. What you said angered me, but this is our master's place, so I let go of my anger and leave. I wonder what teaching of his has made me overcome my anger, never having seen me as disabled in 19 years of study. Now, seeing you scorn my physical disability while we exchange moral teachings is surely wrong. Embarrassed, Zi San hastily said, Enough, no more need to say. Reflection, this story illustrates that Shentu Jia, despite his physical disability, had a fulfilled spirit, whereas Zisan, though physically intact, had a flawed spirit. Historical records show Zisan, also known as Gongtan Kiao, was an upright and intelligent prime minister in Tring, renowned far and wide. Historian Sima Qian wrote, As prime minister in Tring, Zisan was beyond deceit. However, his adherence to the teachings of Zhuangzi led to criticism from other philosophers. Yet, the dialogue between Shentu Jia and Zi San presents a real lesson in conduct. Disabilities are unfortunate, and those who are able should not scorn the disabled, but treat them with normalcy and kindness. As the saying goes, don't boast of your health until you're past 70. Zi San Sharing a master with Shen Tu Jia feared losing face by being seen as equals. Moreover, proclaiming himself as the governing official, if true, was absurd. Shen Tu Jia criticized those who disguise their faults and think themselves undeserving of punishment, implying that even saints cannot avoid fault upon close inspection. This highlights the key lesson from Master Bahan Von Han. 
Achieving perfect virtue means not differentiating between self and others or external appearances. Thus, he never saw Shen Tu Jia's physical disability. This key point explains Shen Tu Jia's ability to overcome anger without dwelling on others' faults, offering a deeper moral understanding through Taoist teachings. 9. Learning the Secret of Immortality King Zhao of Yan had heard rumors about a sage who possessed the secret to immortality. Eager to learn this art for himself, he dispatched a messenger to acquire this knowledge. However, before the lessons could be completed, the sage who was supposed to hold the secret to eternal life passed away. Infuriated by the failure, King Zhao wanted to execute the messenger for his inability to learn the secret. One of the king's favored officials intervened, arguing, What people fear most is death, from which no one can escape. What they treasure most is life itself. My lord, if you value life so dearly, why would you take it from another? Moreover, the death of the sage proves that he did not possess the secret to immortality after all. Hearing this, King Zhao decided against executing the messenger. In another case, a man from Qi wanted to learn the secret to eternal life. Upon learning of the sage's death, he was filled with regret for not having sought the knowledge sooner. Fu Zi joked with him, saying, The sage has died, yet you still regret not learning from him, which shows you've understood nothing of his teachings. However, someone argued against Fu Zi, pointing out, the sage's words might have been mistaken. Perhaps there are those who understand the theory of immortality but cannot practice it, and others who can practice it but do not grasp the theory. Look at the state of Wei, where a man proficient in mathematics passed his secrets to his son who failed to apply them. Yet another person learned these secrets from the son and was able to advance the field of mathematics significantly. Thus, it's possible that the sage did indeed grasp the theory behind the art of living forever. Commentary History states, King Zhao of Yan was deeply fascinated by the pursuit of immortality, indulging in various elixirs, which ultimately led to his premature death at the age of 50. King Zhao was a wise and capable ruler who used the strategies of Yue to defeat Qi, avenging societal wrongs by killing the King of Qi. However, his command to execute the messenger who failed to learn the secret of immortality was unreasonable. The death of the sage, who had deceived people with promises of eternal life, should have been a clear indication to the king that the sage had no such power. Moreover, pursuing the art of immortality means valuing life so it contradicts the act of taking life. The man from Qi also sought the dream of living forever, but the sage's death left him regretting not learning sooner. This blind faith in immortality lacks rationality and can be seen as fanaticism. The death of the sage demonstrates that he was a fraud. Later, Emperor Qin Shi Huang died at the age of 45, his final years marred by the consumption of immortality elixirs, which left him emaciated, with gray skin, dark lips, and a volatile temper, showing the toll these potions took on him. It said, Perhaps some understand the theory of immortality but cannot execute it, which holds true in various fields. To this day, no one has achieved true immortality. In Taoism, figures like Zhang Daoling, Zhang Sunfeng, Lu Dongbin, and Ge Hong, who lived beyond a hundred years, knew the methods of prolonging life through purifying the heart and desiring less. Yet the dream of eternal life remains just that, a fantastical illusion. Sit 10. Between Usefulness and Uselessness One day, Zhuangzi took his disciples for a wander and, seizing the moment, decided to visit a friend's house. The host, overjoyed by their arrival, exclaimed, Your reputation resounds like thunder, sir. Your visit today is a tremendous honor. 
He then turned to call a servant, instructing, We have esteemed guests today. Prepare a bird for our feast to start the conversation. The servant asked, Yes, sir, but we have two birds. One sings beautifully and the other does not. Which one should we prepare? The host, slightly annoyed, replied, Obviously prepare the one that cannot sing. What use do we have for something useless? As Zhuangzi and the host sipped wine and dined on the bird, they discussed the human condition until it was time to leave. Upon reaching the edge of a forest, they encountered a woodcutter resting his axe, gazing at the vast wilderness before him. In front of him stood a giant tree. Zhuangzi asked, The day grows late, and yet I see you haven't felled any tree. Why not cut down this tall one right before you? The woodcutter sighed. I wish I could, but its wood is too soft and porous, utterly useless for any purpose. Hearing this, a disciple inquired, So, a useless tree is spared, but a useless bird is killed. I fail to understand the ways of the world. Zhuangzi smiled. We find ourselves between what is deemed useful and useless. Only those of true virtue can avoid disaster. Commentary This is a fable intended to offer advice to humanity. Zhuangzi's conclusion may seem off-topic, as birds and trees are not humans. The concepts of usefulness and uselessness are simple facets of life. Yet, it invites reflection on how to navigate the invisible line between them. Zhuangzi states, only through virtue. The so-called useless are not incapable of contributing. They can still perform tasks if given the chance. The useless may be exploited by the cunning until they are utterly exhausted, while the useful take on too much, becoming pawns of those in power. Ultimately, whether useful or useless, one can be exploited. According to ancient wisdom, only the wise and virtuous, using wisdom to avoid being used and kindness to avoid being despised, can escape the traps set by others. This principle is illustrated in a historical event from the state of Qi, where amidst turmoil, two friends helped princes escape. One advisor, by opting for smaller, trustworthy states for refuge, ensured his prince's swift return to power, while the other, seeking shelter in a powerful but distant state, did not. The story highlights the fate of the useless and the useful alike, both at risk of being eliminated. However, due to their exceptional strategy and intelligence, the advisors avoided this fate, underlining the narrative's moral. Only through moral integrity and wisdom can one truly preserve oneself. 11. The Image of an Ancient Maiden Since his exile, Ngututu wandered, begging along the way with an empty stomach. Upon arriving in the land of Fien Duong, he saw a young woman washing silk by the Lai Thui riverbank with a rice packet set beside her. Tutu spoke up, I am at my wit's end, hence my begging. Please, would you help me? The young woman looked up at Tutu and replied, You don't seem like an ordinary man. How could I refuse to help over such a trivial matter? She opened her rice packet and offered it to Ngu Tutu and Thang, Thang being the child of Crown Prince Qian, who had fled to avoid being killed by his father, only to later be betrayed and killed in Tring. Tutu had taken Thang with him. Both Ingu Tutu and Thang ate together. Knowing the young woman was poor and lived in a secluded area, Tutu dared not eat all the rice and left some for her. The young woman insisted, You have a long journey ahead. Please finish it all. Ngu Tutu and Thang ate up. Before leaving, Ngu Tutu promised, I will never forget your kindness. I am a fugitive. Should you meet others, please do not reveal my presence. The young woman lamented, For thirty years, I've never spoken to any man. Now for a meal, I've lost my virtue. Go on, leave. A few steps away, Tutu turned back to see the young woman embracing a rock 
leaping into the river to drown herself. Overwhelmed with grief, Tutu bit his finger until it bled and wrote twenty characters on a rock. You washed silk, I begged for food. My stomach full, you submerged. Ten years hence, a thousand gold in repayment. Tutu then covered the rock with earth and led Thang into the land of Ngo. Reflection Even today, when people find themselves in dire straits, resorting to begging to get by, Ngu Tutu's act of begging is not surprising. The question lies with the country girl who, after offering Ngu Tutu a meal, chose to drown herself. Why did she commit suicide? Some say it was because of Tutu's warning. Should you meet others, please do not reveal my presence, giving her peace of mind. But that's superficial. Her statement, You don't seem like an ordinary man. How could I refuse to help over such a trivial matter? Suggest Tutu was perceived as a person of importance. Such a trivial matter not only refers to her skipping a meal, but also implies the impropriety of a woman being alone with a man in a secluded place. Thus, her lamentation, For thirty years I've never spoken to any man. Now, for a meal, I've lost my virtue. The term virtue here signifies chastity, purity of both body and soul. Chastity is a testament to one's honor. Without it, chastity is meaningless. Many may not physically commit adultery, but entertain it in thought. A woman's honor is not confined to the nobility, not just to ladies, princesses, nor to wealthy families alone. From today's perspective, the young woman's death might seem foolish, but to those valuing honor in ancient times, reputation was deemed more valuable than life itself. For the body may perish, but honor remains. This story captures both the nobility and the tragedy of such an image. 12. Old Man Ma's Horse Purchase, or The Judgment of the World The Ma family had a long history of breeding and selling horses. There was a time when the family faced financial ruin due to the illness of Mr. Ma's son, which drained all their savings, despite selling all their horses for his treatment. Fortunately, the son survived. Afterward, Mr. Ma began saving and eventually heard of a rare breed of horse available in Huang Lam. Despite the horse being somewhat skinny, he recognized its value and purchased it at a high price, convinced that this breed could bring wealth to their household. Mr. Ma and his son, concerned about the dangers of the journey home, decided to travel together. As they passed through a village, villagers criticized them for both riding the horse, suggesting it was too thin for such a burden. Heeding their advice, Mr. Ma let his son ride alone. In another village, the locals scolded the son for not showing filial piety by riding while his father walked. Subsequently, Mr. Ma rode the horse, only to be rebuked again for making his recently recovered son walk. They then decided to lead the horse by foot, but were later ridiculed for not utilizing such a fine horse for riding or breeding. Feeling defeated by the relentless judgment, they released the horse into the wild. Upon returning home, Mrs. Ma was distraught, criticizing the waste of their resources and lamenting the impossibility of pleasing everyone. Reflection Indeed, you can't please everyone. Mr. Ma's kindness bordered on a lack of self-confidence. Outsiders cannot fully understand the circumstances of Mr. Ma and his horse. While each piece of advice seemed reasonable, Mr. Ma needed to trust his own judgment above all. There's a saying, nine people, ten opinions, implying the tenth and most important opinion should be one's own. Deciding to buy the horse was a firm intention, but retaining that intention, the horse, required decisiveness, lacking either led to failure. 13. The Tale of the Cicada and the State of Lu One morning, Crown Prince Hugh entered the palace with his bow and arrows, soaking wet, just as he encountered King Fu Sai. 
The king asked, Why are your clothes drenched, and where have you been with your bow and arrows? The prince replied, I went hunting and accidentally fell into a pit. How could you fall into a pit by accident? asked the king. The prince explained, I saw a cicada singing and attempted to catch it. Suddenly, a praying mantis leapt up to catch the cicada, and then a sparrow nearby seemed ready to snatch the praying mantis. I stepped back to prepare to catch the sparrow, but unexpectedly I fell into a marsh. The king said, You only saw the immediate benefit without considering the potential harm. Is there anyone as foolish as you? The prince responded, Yet there are those who are even more foolish. Lu was historically a state of rites and music, first with Duke of Zhu and later Confucius, never offending Qi. Yet, Qi still launched an attack, thinking it could conquer Lu. Little did they know, our state of Wu traveled thousands of miles to attack Qi, and the Vietnamese sent their suicide squads to attack Wu. King Fu Sai, enraged, shouted, Be gone! Be gone! That's the rhetoric of the old bandit Ngu Vien. I've killed that bandit already. If you are truly my son, never speak of this matter again. Terrified, Crown Prince Hu withdrew. Commentary Previously, Ngu Tu Tu painstakingly advised Fu Sai on this matter and was killed by Fu Sai, under the belief that the Vietnamese would never dare to rebel. Crown Prince Hugh used the images of the cicada, praying mantis, and sparrow to represent the states of Lu, Qi, Wu, and Vietnam, respectively. It is said, No one is as deaf as those who do not want to hear. No one is as blind as those who do not want to see. King Fu Sai was not foolish, but he refused to listen to rightful advice. Although King Fu Sai did not kill his son directly, by launching an attack on Qi and convening the feudal lords once again, the Vietnamese launched a surprise attack on Wu and killed Hu. It was as if King Fu Sai had killed his own son. 14. The Zither of Statecraft Nine years into his reign, King Qi of Tung indulged daily in the pleasures of music, wine, and beauty. One day, a man named Zhou Ji from the state of Qi requested an audience with the king, claiming he was a musician who heard of the king's fondness for music and had come to play for him. The king ordered a zither to be brought forth. Zhou Ji tuned the instrument but did not play a note. When the king asked for a performance, Zhou Ji replied, Understanding the theory behind the instrument is crucial for the sounds it produces are merely vibrations of its strings. The king then inquired, What is this theory you speak of? Zhou Ji solemnly explained, To play, Ji, means to forbid or restrain. It symbolizes the restriction of indulgences to uphold moral integrity. In the zither, the largest string represents the king, while the smaller strings symbolize his subjects. Historically, the zither had five strings under Emperor Shun, to which King Wen of Zhou added one more, and King Wu of Zhou another, to signify the harmonious relationship between ruler and ruled, illustrating its use in governance. The king conceded, Indeed, you must know how to create harmony. Zhou Ji responded, Just as I have learned to play the zither, surely a king must know how to govern his state. If you hold the mandate of the land yet fail to govern, how is that different from me holding a zither and not playing? If I do not play, you are displeased. If you neglect your duties, the people are displeased. The king was taken aback, realizing Zhou Ji used the zither as a metaphor to advise him. Subsequently, the king appointed Zhou Ji as a national general, under whom the state of Qi was revitalized into a formidable power. Commentary. This tale is also a clever use of rhetoric. King Qi's appreciation for music allowed Zhou Ji to gain his audience by claiming expertise in playing the zither. Had Zhou Ji directly advised the king against his indulgences, 
he might not have been received. As Joe G. pointed out, music serves a ceremonial and governing function, its harmonies bringing peace, comfort, and joy. Music denotes the melodies, while its sounds are meant to bring joy. Ancient dynasties, before the Zhou, utilized music in rituals and court assemblies. Under King Zhou of the Shang Dynasty, the grand musician Shi Yan composed music for the court ladies to sing to, eventually giving rise to two types of music, one for the court and one for the palace, with the latter developing into what could be termed licentious music. Shi Yan's composition, the Mi Mi, became infamous for its sensual allure at the time, leading to King Zhou neglecting his duties for pleasure and desire. When King Wu of Zhou conquered the Shang and killed King Zhou, Shi Yan fled to the state of Wei and ended his life in the Bo River. It is said that on quiet nights near the river, the enchanting Mimi can still be heard. A saying that remains to this day on the Bo River, amidst the bridal procession, refers to illicit relations, echoed in the tale of The Tale of Q. As plays are staged on the bow in bridal veils, why seek out such a person? Joji's words emphasize the foundational importance of music, using the homophones for zither, ji, and to govern, ji, to awaken the king's sense of duty. Joji became a renowned national general of his time, unmatched in key since the Anon period. 15. Thuan Vukon tests his skills against Trao Qi. In a remarkable demonstration of intellectual prowess, Thuan Vukon, the most esteemed debater of the Qi state, challenged Trao Qi, who had been recently honored with the title of General of the Nation due to his eloquence. Doubting Trao Qi's merit, Thuan Vu Khan, accompanied by his followers, went to meet him. Trao Qi welcomed them graciously. With an air of superiority, Thuan Vu Khan asked if he could pose some straightforward questions to the general, who humbly accepted the challenge. Thuan Vu Khan's questions were profound, touching on loyalty, integrity, natural harmony, the use of talent, and the importance of justice in governance, each veiled in simplicity. Trao Qi responded with insight, accepting each lesson with the promise of implementation. This exchange showcased Trao Qi's deep understanding and intelligence, leaving Thuan Vu Khan in awe and his followers bemused by his sudden respect. This story illustrates the use of metaphor in discussing the principles of good governance. Trao Qi's ability to instantly grasp the hidden meanings in Thuan Vu Khan's questions revealed a mind of great agility and depth. Each response perfectly matched the question, suggesting a profound connection between the two men. The five principles discussed are central to nation-building, showing the story's depth beyond its simplicity. The narrative ends on a humorous note, highlighting Thuan Vu Khan's unexpected humility in the face of Trao Qi's wisdom, much to the amusement of his disciples. 16. Incompetent officials are praised, competent ones are criticized. In a society where mediocrity is praised and excellence criticized, Trao Kai remembered the words of Thuan Vu Khan and worked with utmost diligence and care. Rumors spread that the official governing A land was virtuous, while the one in Tukmak was disparaged. Taking this seriously, Trao Qi investigated and reported his findings to King Te Uivuang. The king summoned his ministers, including the two officials in question. Before the court, the Tukmak official was hardly respected. The king questioned him about the criticisms. He replied that he only focused on his duties, unaware of any praise or criticism. King Te Uivuang, having investigated Tukmak, found its fields flourishing, its people prosperous, and its administration efficient. He realized the official was dedicated to the people without bribing court officials, which led to the criticism. 
Acknowledging his integrity, the king honored him. The official from A-Land was then questioned about the constant praise he received. An investigation revealed neglected fields, impoverished people, and failure to defend against invaders. He had bribed court officials for favorable opinions. Declared corrupt, he begged for mercy, but was sentenced to death by boiling oil, terrifying the onlookers. The king also punished those who unfairly praised or criticized officials, warning his closest allies through drastic measures. This reform instilled fear among the vassals. The lesson here is ubiquitous across societies. Today is no different from the past, where individuals resort to bribery for advantages, including academic credentials without merit, reminiscent of past corrupt officials. Fortunately, wise rulers with righteous ministers can rectify such wrongs. The case of these two officials serves as a lesson to those responsible for their people. 17. Humanity and Wisdom Confucius and his disciples were exiled from the state of Lu and wandered into foreign lands. One day, Confucius summoned one of his 72 wise disciples, Tzu Kung, and asked, What, in your opinion, defines a person of humanity and a person of wisdom? After a moment of thought, Tzu Kung answered, Master, a person of humanity is one who knows compassion for others. A person of wisdom is one who understands others. Confucius praised the answer as excellent. Then he called in another disciple, Tzu Lu, and posed the same question. Tzu Lu pondered for a while before replying, Master, a person of humanity is one who knows compassion for oneself. A person of wisdom is one who understands oneself. Confucius was greatly impressed. Following this, he asked Zhengzi the same question. Zhengzi replied, In my view, a person of humanity is one who makes themselves lovable to others, and a person of wisdom is one who makes themselves understandable to others. Confucius was astonished and exclaimed in admiration, How unexpected! Commentary the same question elicited three completely different answers, showcasing an interesting and surprising diversity of thought. Life, much like a river, can be turbulent, winding through narrow gorges or calmly flowing across plains, always adapting to the landscape. Similarly, human actions and interactions vary with the situation, sometimes focusing on others, sometimes on oneself, but always striving for appropriateness. This adaptability mirrors principles in mathematics. Over 2,300 years ago, the Greek mathematician Euclid stated that from a point outside a straight line, one can draw only one line parallel to the given line, a foundational concept in geometry. Yet, in England, Riemann posited that no line parallel could be drawn, and subsequently, Lobachevsky argued that infinitely many parallels are possible, illustrating the subjectivity and context dependence of truth. As noted by a contemporary of Confucius, Ngu Tutu, caring for oneself is essential to being able to care for others, and vice versa. Confucius's disciples might have narrowly interpreted moral principles, but humanity and wisdom inherently exist in everyone, their application depending merely on the circumstance. Hence, judging actions as right or wrong, just or unjust, can be complex, as they are influenced by the specific circumstances individuals find themselves in. 18. Burning the Stable Once upon a time, a scholar traveled to the capital to take an exam. While waiting for the examination day, he stayed temporarily at a grand and spacious inn. The innkeeper, noticing the scholar was short on money, allowed him to sleep in the horse stable instead of inside the inn. One day, after returning from an exam, the scholar went to check on the stable only to find it engulfed in flames. He shouted for help while trying to put out the fire and search for water. The fire caused significant damage to the inn. 
the innkeeper accused the scholar before the local magistrate, claiming, This student asked to stay at my inn, and since he had no money, I didn't allow him inside, but didn't have the heart to turn him away. So I let him stay in the stable without charge. Out of spite, he set my property on fire as revenge. The magistrate asked if anyone witnessed the student starting the fire or could testify against him. The innkeeper replied, It was quiet at noon with few passers-by, but I saw him start the fire myself. He shouted fire while looking for a place to hide. The magistrate thought, Why would the innkeeper lie to harm him? She let him sleep in the stable for free, which makes her a good person. Believing the innkeeper's words without listening to the scholar's defense, the magistrate sentenced the scholar to prison. Two years later, after serving his sentence, the scholar returned to the capital and found out he had passed the exam. However, since he wasn't present to claim his degree, it was in vain. Frustrated and resentful, the scholar managed to get a proper scholar's robe, returned to the inn, and secretly set the storage house on fire before pretending to be a new guest. As smoke billowed, he shouted, Fire! Fire! and joined others in trying to extinguish the flames. The innkeeper seemed not to recognize him. The scholar left, murmuring about the injustices of life. Oh, life! The innocent are imprisoned while the guilty are rewarded. Commentary the scholar appears embittered by life's injustices. Upon reflection, the innkeeper wasn't inherently evil, but accused the scholar out of short-sighted frustration. In the past, gentlemen seldom defended themselves against slander, accepting their fate without bitterness if their words were not heard. Ultimately, harboring resentment serves no benefit. As Buddhism teaches, one should not argue against false accusations, for in arguing, there is no liberation. However, the author of Burning the Stable suggests an alternative perspective. People often misunderstand or make subjective judgments. Those who contribute positively should be rewarded, while wrongdoers should face consequences. Here, the opposite happens. To achieve justice, Assessing a person's merits and faults should not be done rashly. 19. The Ocean of Great Fish In the quiet realm of Dien An, a noble lord named Quach Quan Dien An desired to reconstruct the fortress of Tiet with unmatched grandeur and solemnity. Despite the cautious advice of his guests, Dien An refused to listen, sternly proclaiming, Whoever dares to dissent will face my blade. Amid this tension, a visitor came forth, asking for an audience with Kwak Kwan Dien An, promising to speak but three words or else willingly leave. Summoned before Kwak Kwan, the guest simply stated, The ocean of great fish, and promptly turned to leave. Kwak Kwan, intrigued, urged him to stay repeating his invitation as the guest hastened away, claiming, A humble soul dares not jest with death itself. Dien An, curious, bade the visitor continue. The guest elaborated, Have you not heard of the great fish? No net can ensnare it, no line can hold it. Yet should it find itself beached, even the tiniest ants can tear it apart. To you, the state of Qi is as the ocean to the great fish. While Ki remains, this fortress of Tiet may seem trivial, but should Ki fall, even a fortress reaching the heavens would be in vain. Enlightened, Kwak Kwan Dien An acknowledged the wisdom in these words and abandoned his plans for the fortress. Commentary This passage illustrates the art of persuasion. The phrase, the ocean of great fish, initially lacks clear meaning compelling the listener's curiosity, a crucial tactic. The guest's subsequent retreat further captivates Dien An, enhancing the allure and leading to the abandonment of his fortress project. Historically, the land of Tiet was a fief awarded by the King of Qi to the military general Dien An, 
symbolizing a nation within a nation. Building a robust fortress for defense isn't wasteful, but focusing solely on Tiet for personal gain disregards the broader national interest. Such actions, driven by selfish intent, could deplete the public treasury and raise suspicions among the court and suffering among the people. The guest's admonition targeted this very concern. After Dien An's demise, his successor, Dien Van, continued his legacy as Man Thuong Quan, with Tiet remaining a fief as before. 20. What constitutes theft? In the state of Qi, there was a wealthy family named Guo, while in the state of Song, there was a destitute family named Xiang. The Xiang family sought to learn the secret of wealth from the Guo family. Mr. Guo explained, I excel in the art of theft. The first year of theft provides enough sustenance, the second year brings wealth, and by the third year, one becomes exceedingly affluent. It is through this surplus wealth that I am able to aid the impoverished. Overjoyed by this revelation, the Xiang family took to thievery, spending their days lurking and burrowing through walls. Unfortunately, they were eventually caught, imprisoned, and their assets confiscated. Upon release, Mr. Xiang, distressed, confronted Mr. Guo to understand his method of theft. Mr. Guo elucidated, Nature goes through four seasons, producing various resources. By harvesting these, I accumulate wealth. Whether it's hunting on land or fishing in the waters, I am simply taking what nature offers, which belongs to no individual. This type of theft does not attract misfortune. However, stealing from individuals inevitably leads to punishment. Who else can you blame? Still skeptical, Mr. Xiang sought further insight from a sage, who echoed Mr. Guo's explanation. Commentary The narrative by thinker Liet Ungu Kao employs allegory to suggest that daily life requires diligent labor. All goods created by humans have their origins in nature. It depends on whether individuals are willing to work for them. Notice how plants thrive in place because the soil provides essential nutrients, but it is through the root's effort to absorb these nutrients. Similarly, the varied colors of leaves and flowers result from the nourishment available in the air, depending on their ability to receive it. The abundance of marine life in waters is thanks to the nutrients they provide, necessitating work from all creatures for survival. Mr. Guo's reference to theft was metaphorical, whereas Xiang took it literally. Historical records from the spring and autumn period reveal that the Guo family, serving as high officials in Qi, were wealthy like nobles, diligent in their work and charitable. In contrast, the Xiang family, despite being high officials in Song focused on governance, overlooked their personal circumstances, living a life of hardship. This fable highlights the tragedy of Mr. Xiang's misunderstanding and his failure to inquire more deeply before acting. Today, even with ample resources and land, the lament remains for those unwilling to work, hoping one night of theft equals three years of labor. 21. Advocating for a friend in distress. The story of Mao Bian, a guest in the state of Qi, and his relationship with his host, Tin Quach Quan Dian An, exemplifies loyalty and unconventional wisdom amidst adversity. Mao Bian, despite his numerous flaws, was deeply cherished by Tin Quach Quan, much to the dismay of other guests, including Dian An's son, Man Thuong Quan Dian Van. Tin Quach Quan's fierce declaration to protect Mao Bian even at the expense of his own household's harmony, underscores the depth of their bond. Mao Bian was accorded the highest hospitality and was served diligently by Dian An's eldest son, illustrating the esteem in which he was held. Years later, when the state of Qi underwent a change in leadership, 
With Ting Quach Quan falling out of favor and being removed from his position, he and Mao Bian retired to a modest dwelling. Despite the peril, Mao Bian courageously sought an audience with the new ruler Tu Yen Vuong to advocate for Tin Quach Quan's reinstatement. Mao Bian's astuteness and eloquence, particularly in recounting instances where he openly disagreed with Tin Quach Quan, impressed Tu Yen Vuong and led to a re-evaluation of Tin Quach Quan's character and contributions. The narrative not only highlights the intricate dynamics of loyalty, courage, and intelligence, but also raises important considerations about friendship and the value of unconventional individuals. Mao Bian, despite his imperfections, demonstrated unwavering support and dedication to Ting Quach Quan, ultimately securing his return to favor. This story serves as a testament to the idea that true friendship and loyalty can transcend societal judgments and expectations, encouraging a deeper appreciation for diverse perspectives and the complexities of human relationships. 22. The Friendship of Tin Lang Quan Tin Lang Quan, also known as Wei Wu Ji, was a nobleman from the Wei royal family known for his pure heart and kindness. He enjoyed the company of talented and virtuous individuals without discrimination of their social standing, often engaging with them with great respect. In the state of Wei, there was a reclusive sage named Hu Ying, a 70-year-old man living in poverty, who worked as a gatekeeper at the D Gate in Daliang. Hearing of his reputation, Wei Wuji sought him out and respectfully befriended him. Hao Ying, moved by Wei Wuji's sincerity, could not refuse his friendship and introduced him to a pig butcher from the market named Chu Hoi. Despite Chu Hoi never returning his gestures, Wei Wuji continued to visit him without any complaints. One day, Wei Wuji hosted a banquet inviting new acquaintances. He personally went to invite Hao Ying and then to the market to invite Chu Hoi. Among the distinguished guests of royals, ministers, generals, and noble ladies, Wei Wuji treated Ho Ying and Chu Hoi as honored guests. This led to some murmurs of disapproval among the other attendees. Meanwhile, the state of Qin sent General Wang Hat with an army to besiege Hamdan of Zhao, pressuring Zhao's general, Zhao Sheng, to consider surrender. Zhao Sheng, who had connections with Wei Wuji and knew King An of Wei, sent a messenger to Wei seeking military assistance. King An dispatched General Tan Bi with an army to aid Zhao, but upon hearing Qin's threat to destroy any state that would aid Zhao, King An ordered Tan Bi to halt at Yixia. Despite this, Wei Wuji, due to his deep bond with Zhao Sheng, tried persuading King An to proceed with the military support, but to no avail. Distraught over being unable to help his friend, Wei Wuji asked his guests if they would join him in aiding Zhao. Thousands responded to his call. Wei Wuji, leading his volunteers, visited Hao Ying on their way, who wished him strength but excused himself due to old age. A few miles later, Wei Wuji returned, guessing Hu Ying had more to say. Hu Ying smiled, knowing Wei Wuji would come back, and criticized Wei Wuji's plan as futile, suggesting instead to seek help from Queen Niji of Wei, who had a debt of gratitude towards Wei Wuji. Wei Wuji remembered this and went to Queen Niji, who stole military tokens for him. He then returned to Hu Ying, who advised him to also bring Chu Hoi. Chu Hoi, though a humble pig butcher, was ready to do his part for the great cause. Hu Ying, unable to join the battle, offered his life in sacrifice for Wei Wuji's success. With the military token, Wei Wuji and Chu Hoi gained command of Tan Bi's troops. Chu Hoi killed Tan Bi for hesitating to follow the royal order and led the Wei army to defeat Qin's forces at Hamdan, lifting the siege and enhancing Wei Wuji's reputation. Commentary 
In the late Warring States period, young royals and high officials often opened their doors to new talents, exemplified by figures across various states. Unlike the unworthy or the traders of kin, these patrons harbored thousands of guests for over a decade. Wei Wuji stood out for treating his guests, regardless of their humble beginnings, with utmost respect and kindness, leading them in a bold campaign against Qin. This story illustrates the deep bonds of friendship and loyalty that transcended social hierarchies, with Wei Wuji's unwavering support for his friends, even in the face of great danger, highlighting his exceptional character. 3. Beauty and Vanity One day, Master Duong Chu was passing through the state of Song and temporarily stayed at an inn. The innkeeper had two wives. One was very beautiful, and the other was quite unattractive. However, the less attractive wife was more beloved by her husband. Curious, Duong Chu inquired about the reason, to which the innkeeper replied, The beautiful one prides herself on her beauty, which I fail to see. The unattractive one considers herself unattractive, which I don't see at all. Duong Chu then turned to his disciples and said, You see, if you do good deeds, don't boast about being good. Isn't it true that wherever you go, you will be loved? Commentary It's often human nature to boast about what we take pride in, wealth, skill, beauty. This tendency can cause dissatisfaction among those around us. The true value and appeal of our achievements, like the hidden pastille of a flower, only reveal themselves when the time is right, capturing attention when they bloom naturally. A forced blossom, like flaunted talent or beauty, can have the opposite effect. There's a saying, character trumps beauty. Simple as it may seem, not everyone can adhere to this principle. 24. The Jealousy of Lady Trin Tu King Sohawai was a ruler known for his romantic escapades, yet he was remarkably inept at governing his kingdom. Among his consorts was Trin Tu, a woman of stunning beauty but also of venomous nature and greed. The king introduced a new beauty to his court, whose grace and charm won everyone's hearts. Trin Tu would often visit her, presenting her with precious jewels and lavish garments. One day, Trin Tu told the new beauty, the king despises anyone who breathes on him. Alarmed, the beauty asked, what should I do then? Please help me. Trin Tu advised, you should discreetly cover your nose when near the king. Following this advice, the new beauty acted accordingly. Some time later, the king visited Trin Tu, who, sensing the king's trust, said, Your Majesty, such a refined fragrance you possess, yet the new lady says you smell as foul as a rat. Isn't that infuriating? Recalling how the new beauty would cover her nose around him, King Sohoi roared in anger. He ordered his guards to mutilate the beauty by cutting off her nose and executing her brutally. Reflections Jealousy manifests in countless forms. Some resort to ambushes and physical assaults, others to throwing toxic substances or filth. Trintu's jealousy, however, was of a deeply insidious nature. She first won the new beauty's trust, then cunningly set her trap. Trintu's scheme was so smoothly executed, who wouldn't be deceived? Yet, the blame also falls on King So Hawaii infamous for his dim-wittedness during the Warring States period. Why didn't he question the new beauty directly? Why couldn't he discern the true nature of the fragrance or the foulness? How could he ignore Trin Tu's notorious liaisons with envoys from kin, unknown to the court? In ancient times, many beauties feared being brought to court, likening it to petals adrift on water currents. 25. The Character of a True Talent Zhao Shi of the Zhao State was a tax collector. One day, while collecting taxes from the household of General Zhao Sheng, 
a manager relying on his high-status background refused to pay taxes. Zhao Xi responded by killing the manager. General Zhao Sheng contemplated executing Zhao Xi, who argued, As a noble son of Zhao, is it right to ignore the laws of the land because of your status? If the laws lose their force, the nation weakens. Should other nations see this and invade, could Zhao stand firm? If Zhao falls, your lands fall too. As royalty, upholding the law sets an example for all, ensuring justice and national prosperity. General Zhao Sheng, realizing the truth in Zhao Xi's words, deemed him a sage and recommended him to the king, who appointed Zhao Xi in charge of national taxation. Thanks to his integrity and fairness, the state treasury flourished and the people lived in abundance. Commentary The tendency to abuse power is timeless and universal. Every nation aspires to eradicate it, though it's a challenging endeavor. A nation shines when its laws are strict and its people enlightened. Corruption and abuse of power naturally diminish as individuals become aware of their duties and responsibilities. This story illustrates how General Zhao Sheng's tolerance for his subordinate's lawlessness due to his high rank led to the manager's refusal to pay taxes. Zhao Xi, in defense of the law, was justified in his actions. It is said, the rebels of a nation are the rebels of the world and anyone has the right to eliminate them. Zhao Xi restored justice for the people and the country. 26. The Profile of a Skilled General At that time, Qin was a powerful state, sending General Huo Shang with an army to besiege Udu, a city of Han near the border of Zhao. Han sought assistance from Zhao. The renowned generals of Zhao all agreed that the terrain of Udu was treacherous and Qin's military might was overwhelming, making it impossible to save Han. The king asked Zhao Sha for his opinion. Zhao Sha said, Udu is perilous and narrow. Saving Han would mean we must confront Qin, similar to two mice fighting in a burrow. The side with more courage and strength will win. The king appointed Zhao Sha as the general to lead 50,000 troops to rescue Han. Zhao Sha moved his troops out of the capital, Hamdan, camping 30 miles east. Zhao Sha ordered, anyone discussing our military strategy will be beheaded. Meanwhile, Qin's forces continued their advance towards Udu, causing widespread panic. A soldier, learning of this, exclaimed, Qin's forces are vast, and Udu is in grave danger day and night. Zhao Sha immediately had the soldier beheaded, then ordered the construction of defensive works for a prolonged encampment. General Huo Shang of Qin sent scouts, one of whom was captured by Zhao Sha, fed well, and then released. Predicting the scouts' return to Udu, Zhao Sha swiftly launched an attack. Huo Shang, hearing of this, divided his forces to confront Zhao Sha's troops. At this time, a soldier named Hua Leech, presenting a board stating, willing to be executed, knelt at the camp's entrance. Zhao Sha, intrigued, allowed him to speak. Hua Leech said, Qin did not expect our forces here. Upon discovery, they will surely respond with overwhelming might. Therefore, Marshal, we must consolidate our forces and prepare for their arrival. Failure to do so will surely lead to defeat. Zhao Sha responded, Your order is acknowledged. Hua Leech added, I have violated military law and I am willing to be executed. Zhao Sha replied, wait for further orders. Before the battle, Hua Leech advised, according to military strategy, whoever holds the advantageous terrain wins. The only high ground in Udu is the North Mountain, which General Qin has overlooked. Marshal, we must seize it immediately. Following this advice, Zhao Sha sent Hua Leech with 10,000 troops to take North Mountain, allowing them to monitor Qin's movements and signal Zhao Sha. Enraged, Huo Shang attacked with a massive force, 100,000, 
But Zhao Xia's troops, along with Hua Leech's forces from the mountain, counterattacked fiercely. Qin's army was decisively defeated and retreated to Ham Duong. After this battle, Hua Leech was appointed as a national guardian. Commentary Zhao Xia was a distinguished general of his time, known for his undefeated military career and strict strategic command. His order, discussing military strategy warrants death, seemed counterintuitive to military tactics, but was actually a strategic decoy. By strictly forbidding such discussions, Zhao Xia ensured that Qin's forces remained unaware of their plans, pretending to avoid conflict with Qin. This led Qin's generals to underestimate Zhao Xia Hua Leech, though just a common soldier, turned out to be an exceptional talent, fearlessly advising Zhao Xia. Reflecting on The Art of War by Sun Tzu, it says, Advance without seeking fame, retreat without avoiding blame, protect people at all costs, and benefit the country. Hua Lich embodied these principles. His correct application of military tactics compelled even a stoic and commanding general like Zhao Xia to heed his advice. Both Zhao Xia and Hua Leech, each in their own right, presented an extraordinary figure, with Zhao Xia epitomizing the demeanor of a marshal and Hua Leech the essence of a general. 27. No one understands you like your father does. Zhao Xia had a son named Zhao Kuat, who from a young age was well-read and engaged in numerous discussions. Zhao Kuat would often speak boldly and recklessly, dismissing the opinions of others, including his father, Zhao Xia, who nevertheless did not fully agree with him. Zhao Kuat's mother was delighted with her son's abilities, proclaiming him to be a true leader in the making. However, Zhao Xia disagreed, stating that Kuat was not suitable for military leadership. According to him, the state of Zhao would be fortunate not to have him as a general. When Zhao Kuat's mother argued about his extensive knowledge and insightful discussions on military affairs, Zhao Xia countered that it was precisely Kuat's arrogance and self-perception of unrivaled superiority that disqualified him. Military leadership, Zhao Xia explained, involves the burden of life and death decisions, constant vigilance, fear, and careful planning, learning from each individual yet still prone to mistakes. Kuat's casual approach to these responsibilities indicated a likely disastrous outcome if he were ever to assume military power. Upon hearing his father's words relayed by his mother, Kuat accused his father of being timid due to old age. Two years later, as Zhao Xia was on his deathbed, he summoned Kuat to offer his final advice. Military matters are fraught with danger and previous generations have warned against taking them lightly. Zhao Xia expressed relief at avoiding the disgrace of military defeat, advising Kuat against pursuing a military career to avoid bringing harm to the country and his family. Zhao Xia also instructed his wife to reject any posthumous honors or military titles that might be offered to their son, by recounting his warnings about the grave consequences of military failure. After Zhao Xia's death, despite his warnings, the king of Zhao appointed Zhao Kuat to succeed his father's military position. Commentary It's often expected that progress in society means each generation surpasses the previous one. However, in professional roles, it's not guaranteed that a child will exceed their parent or a younger sibling will surpass an older one. In the art of generalship, beyond innate talent, one must also gain hands-on experience on the battlefield to acquire practical knowledge and understand the terrain, not merely theorize from a place of safety. Zhao Kuat's demeanor showed he was not fit for military leadership, as a general must be composed, reserved, and deeply understanding rather than verbose. Excessive talking can reveal vulnerabilities to enemies. A general's role requires careful speech, avoiding the pitfalls of being overly talkative. 
Historically, Sun Xuyan advised his son, Sun An, acknowledging his limitations and advising him to decline any official position or, if unavoidable, to request an undesirable land to avoid competition. Sun An heeded his father's advice, choosing a simple life over an official position, demonstrating a humility and wisdom Zhao Kuat lacked. 28. When General Zhao Kuat was appointed. At that time, King Zhao Hui had passed away and King Xiao Cheng took the throne. The Qin dynasty commanded General Wang He to attack 17 districts in Shangdong of the Han state, and General Feng Ding, realizing he couldn't hold the territories, offered them to the Zhao. Zhao Shang, the peaceful general of the Upper Plains, came to take over the land. Feng Ding told Zhao Shang, Only if a noble general from Zhao brings a large army here can this land be held. However, after taking control, the peaceful general celebrated a great victory with continuous feasting, for the 17 districts in Shangdang were won without a battle. During this time, the Qin general laid siege for two months. Feng Ding couldn't hold the city and had to flee. King Zhao then dispatched General Lian Po, but by then, Qin had already taken Shangdong and was advancing to Changping. Lian Po managed to hold off the Qin forces for over half a year with no clear victor. The young King Zhao, not understanding the critical nature of military tactics, insisted on offensive strategies without allowing defensive measures. At this time, Qin used counterintelligence through Zhao's traitors, spreading rumors. Qin only fears General Ma Fu of Zhao Kuat. If he leads the troops, Qin will retreat. King Zhao asked Zhao Kuat, Can you defeat Qin? Zhao Kuat boasted, If Qin uses General Bai Qi, I can easily strategize and win, but if they use Wang He, I consider them insignificant. Pleased with Zhao Kuat's confidence, King Zhao appointed him as general to replace Lian Po Luanxiang, lying ill, protested in court. Your Majesty is appointing Zhao Kuat based on mere reputation, like playing a stringless instrument. Zhao Kuat is only book smart without practical skills. The king ignored the advice. Zhao Kuat inspected 200,000 troops and, after the inspection, took several carts of gold and silk home to greet his mother. She reproached him. Have you forgotten your father's teachings at his deathbed? Zhao Kuat retorted, I wanted to refuse, but no one is as capable as me. His mother sent a letter to the king urging, Please do not appoint Zhao Kuat. He is only knowledgeable in books and lacks practical wisdom, unfit to be a general. The king summoned her to court. She said, My husband always shared his rewards with his officers and soldiers, enduring hardships together. As a general, he never neglected household affairs. But Quat, as a general, turns his back to the east, disregarding advice, hoarding the king's gifts at home, and engaging in profit-seeking activities daily. She warned, Appointing Quat as general will harm Zhao. Still, the king did not listen. Zhao Quat led the troops to Changping, facing Bai Qi of Qin. In the first battle, with Zhao Quat deploying 10,000 troops against Bai Qi's 3,000, Zhao won. However, in pursuing the retreating Qin forces, Zhao's army was encircled by Bai Qi for 46 days, resulting in Zhao Kuat's death in battle and Zhao's surrender. That night, Bai Qi buried alive 450,000 Zhao troops, turning the Green River blood red. Commentary The loss of Shangdong by General Zhao Shang, who was merely a figurehead, is not discussed. Zhao Kuat's arrogance and disregard for his father's and mother's teachings led to the burial of 450,000 Zhao troops in one night. King Zhao's trust in Zhao Kuat over Lian Po and Luan Xiang and the mother's moral duty to protest highlights the neglect of wise counsel. 
This defeat weakened the military strength of the six eastern states, Chu, Han, Wei, Zhao, Yan, Qi, giving Qin the opportunity to conquer them. This serves as a profound lesson for rulers through the ages. Those with true talent, especially in military affairs, are calm, speak little, listen much, and their words stand firm like mountains. Only the incompetent brag and bluster. From this, one can infer further lessons. 29. The Demon's Cave Talent Test Demon's Cave, the master, had two outstanding disciples named Sun Tan and Pang Kuyen. One day, wanting to test his disciples' abilities, he called them and said, I'm sitting inside the cave. Which one of you can invite me out? Pang Kuyen hurried to invite first, saying, Master, outside the cave, there are dragons and phoenixes dancing beautifully. The demon's cave replied, Today is an unlucky day. Such things cannot happen. Pang Kuyen then said, White Crane Immortal has invited you to play chess. The master shook his head. I played chess with them yesterday. Pang Kuyen boldly threatened, If you don't come out, I will set the cave on fire. The demon's cave just smiled. Then it was Sun Tan's turn to invite. Sun Tan respectfully said, I cannot invite you out from inside, but if you were outside the cave, I would know how to invite you in. Intrigued, the demon's cave had a chair brought outside to sit on, curious about how Sun Tan would invite him. Once the master was seated, Sun Tan quickly kneeled. Then I have successfully invited you out. The demon's cave admired Sun Tan's wit. Discussion The two times Pang Kuan invited the demon's cave were two blatantly poor attempts of deception. Assuming there were dragons and phoenixes dancing outside or white crane immortal inviting for a chess game, what if the demon's cave still refused to come out? By the third time, without even trying to invite, Pang Kuan resorted to the strategy of setting the cave on fire, revealing his malicious intentions. Indeed, due to his jealousy of Sun Tan, Pang Kuan later sabotaged Sun Tan by tampering with his meal. Pang Kuan deceived his master and harmed his peer. Sun Tan, on the other hand, did not resort to far-fetched schemes but used truth as his strategy for there is no better strategy than truth, and no secret as impenetrable as openness. Even a master like the demon's cave fell for this simple trick. Later, Sun Tan became a military advisor for the key state and twice defeated the Wei army led by Pang Kuan. Ultimately, Pang Kuan committed suicide at Malang. Through this test of wits, one can glimpse into the souls of each individual. 30. The Marquis of Qi Honor His Wife And Ying had many achievements for the state of Qi, for which King Jing of Qi offered him fine woolen robes and land grants. And Ying steadfastly refused. Upon seeing a woman, King Jing asked, Is that the wife of the Marquis? And Ying replied, Indeed she is. King Jing laughed and said, your wife is old and not very attractive. I have a daughter who could marry the Marquis. And Ying clasped his hands and said, When people marry in their youth, they hope to rely on each other in old age. My wife may be old and unattractive, but I cherish her deeply and would not be unfaithful. King Jing greatly admired An Ying for his stance. Commentary in the world, a story of a husband and wife growing old together from the time of their marriage is common. However, among the officials of ancient times, discussing the matter of having only one spouse is very rare. In the past, there was a saying, A man may have five wives and seven concubines while a woman is devoted to one husband. Wife refers to the principal wife and concubines are secondary wives the king offering his daughter to An Ying, elevating someone's status. They considered it an honor, a noble act. But An Ying refused. No nobility is greater than the loyalty of a true heart. 
Wealth changes friends, status changes spouses. This saying has become proverbial. Over 2,500 years ago, and Ying was indeed a progressive figure. Wealth cannot lure to decadence. Poverty cannot sway to deceit. Power cannot intimidate. And Ying is an example of a true gentleman worthy of emulation by all.